Hello, welcome to Beacon Hill Update on Frontier Community Access Television. As always, I'm your host, Chris Collins, back again with a part two of my interview with Greenfield Community College economic and business professor Tom Simmons, running for Congress in the first district, a seat that's currently occupied by Richard Neal of Springfield. We just scratched the surface in part one, so we have a lot to get to in part two, and I want to start off sort of dovetailing with what we ended the first conversation with, which was about security. You mentioned you joined the Coast Guard Auxiliary after 9-11 because right. you wanted to find a way to serve. We always hear security bandied about and the need for to protect our borders, to close our borders, to build a wall, uh, spend more money on defense. And these are things that get a lot of lip service in Congress, but in point of fact, not a lot, not a lot of agreement exists. So as somebody who's been in the Coast Guard, someone who's had military experience and who understands the security issue better than most, what will your position be if you're elected regarding how to keep ourselves safe? All right. If you talk to men and women in the military, a lot of them are concerned, upset, uh, frustrated that they have not gotten the support and the funding they feel that they need to do their jobs. If you look at the federal budget on military spending, it is absolutely through the roof. Mm -hmm. There's a disconnect here. The purpose of our defense forces should not be securing oil fields in Iraq, should not be building schools or hospitals or roads in Afghanistan, should not be trying to figure out who is our friend today in this town in Syria, should not be um, propping up the Saudi regime, <laughs> which is funding Al-Qaeda and ISIS against us while we, you know, throw verbal bombs at Iran. We're in the wrong places and we're doing the wrong things. We need to pull back. National Guard need to be here for emergencies and uh, uh, terrorist attacks and securing borders. Our military needs to be in the United States. Funding, instead of going to buy $3 billion ships or planes that even people in the military say, what, what do we need this for? We don't need this. That needs to be going to the military themselves. We, uh, the, the spending priorities have moved towards um, buying corporate goodies from large suppliers and nation building and empire building around the world. None of that makes us more secure. None of it makes us more secure. So I absolutely would pull back a great deal from, uh, from, uh, from trying to be the policeman of the world. That's, that, that's not how you protect yourself. You don't protect yourself when all your, all your men and women are scattered around the earth. Are you suggesting a more of an isolationist tract, or are you saying that the money has to be redistributed in a better way? We're both. Uh, I'm saying it needs to be redistributed, absolutely. I mean, you've got, we've got veterans who come back missing arms and legs and with PTSD and, and, and facial burns and they're not getting the treatment they need. Um, so we absolutely need to re, uh, to decide how we're spending our military dollars. We could probably take care of them and spend less. And I wouldn't call it isolationist. I would say when I protect my yard, my home, I'm doing the right thing. When I decide to take it upon myself to walk around the neighborhood and uh, check out everyone else's window and door and doormat, I, I'm not, uh, that, that's not appropriate. And that's what our military is doing. You know, it, it's, it's, th that's a good position, but it's a lot easier politically to say, let's just build a wall. We'll just make it higher and higher and higher. Right? We'll, we'll, we'll build a wall on the southern border and make Mexico pay for it, right? You know, let me, the, the wall thing makes me crazy because, first of all, the 911 terrorists came in from Canada, <laughs> not from Mexico. That's right. Secondly, and I've said this to everyone who raises the build the wall issue, half of the U.S.-Mexican border is the Rio Grande River. <laughs> who is going to build a wall in the middle of the river? Well, I mean, Don, well, Donald Trump is. Has Donald Trump ever looked at a map? Because you're not going to build a wall in the middle of a river. It's not going to happen. Secure borders, of course. B you know, border security, of course. Talk about building a wall, again, is just, it, it's, it's just telling someone what they want to hear. It's like, yeah, build a wall. Throwing Be red realistic. Meat. Throwing red Be meat. realistic. Okay, so let's talk about realism. The, the new president takes office. Uh, you're in Congress now. You're part of the new Congress. The new president calls up and says, Tom, come on down to the Oval. I want to talk a little bit about defense spending. 
what would your suggestion be if a president came to you and said, okay, I want to rethink this, what would be the first thing you would change? If they said you could change any one thing in the military, what would it be? The proportion of allocation of funds to uh, large equipment, battleship planes, versus the proportion being given to the boots on the ground. Okay. Absolutely. And take care of our veterans, too. That come Absolutely. That's, that's all part of that package. Yeah. Um, well, I want to sort of dovetail a little bit with this into another conversation, and it's not necessarily a congressional issue, but, or a federal issue, but it is a state issue, and that's the issue of drugs. A lot of these uh, vets that are coming back, some of them are ending up on the street and are ending up with major drug problems. We have a heroin crisis, an epidemic. Um, is this something that the federal government needs to take a more of a hands-on approach, or is it a state issue? In terms of taking care of, in the terms of, we got two issues here. Yeah. One, one is, one is uh, uh, drugs in general, and one are vets. Yeah. Probably one third of our homeless are vets, um, and anyone who has worked with uh, with addicts or with people dealing with addictions, they will tell you the number one issue is actually housing. That when you provide housing, a, a safe location, not a bed in a big room where yeah. you have to go out at a certain time, a not a shelters, time. but actual housing. Right. Yeah. How when you provide housing, you that is actually the best first step towards getting anyone the treatment. Uh, they need or to getting them back into society. State of Utah has done this. They've yep. eliminated homelessness. Uh, a city in Canada has done the same thing. Um, Housing Works, which is a nonprofit corporation in New York City, same exact thing. They were targeting homeless uh, youth who were HIV positive, not getting medical treatment. They found out that finding housing and stable location for them was better than, uh, than just trying to treat the medical issue. So, to go back to your question, because I like to answer questions, unlike politicians who just go off on a tangent, um, yes, obviously, there's a, yes, there's a role for the federal government there, because it's the, if the federal government is going to send men and women in uniform around the world, then they need to take care of them with the issues they bring back when they finally come back home. Yeah, and, and it just seems like you mentioned the VA, which is such a sore spot for people. I mean, you know, as an example of a failed single-payer system, I mean, you're not going to find anything worse no, you're not. than what you see there. Now, and, and, you know, my dad was a vet, but he never had to use VA services, and I'm almost glad he never had to because he, he had pretty good health insurance coverage through the town that he worked in. Um, so let's talk about the outsider factor a little bit. You know, we've got a new president. It's going to be elected. It's going to, well, who knows what's going to be at this point. <laughs> yeah. We're recording this. It could be any one of <coughs> probably three people. Um, we talked a little bit about this in the first show, but I want to expound on it a little bit more. Trump and Sanders, when you see the, the inroads that they've made, it's a pretty serious indictment of the current system that we have. It is absolutely an indictment. In, in both, and a lot of people may not superficially see, a, a, you know, a, any similarities between Trump and Sanders. And yet, both of them have tapped into um, uh, an anger. Both of them have tapped into a large portion of the American uh, population feeling marginalized, feeling like no matter what they do and how hard they try, they're not getting ahead. Their incomes are not getting ahead. Their politicians are not listening to them. And they've each, they've each reached a different demographic yeah. and philosophical segment, but the underlying issues of we, we're losing control here. The people are losing control of the government and we're being left behind. They're absolutely present in both groups. Yeah, I think that's the, the one thread that is common is tapping into that frustration. And I think the, what, what is interesting about Sanders, though, is here's a guy who's in his 80s, right? He's a senator. He's not even really a Democrat. He's an, un, he's an independent. And yet the young people are flocking to him. It, it, you know, I wasn't really, well, I was around, but I wasn't, I was, I was only like a, a baby when Bobby Kennedy ran in 1968. And I can just imagine having seen the newsreel footage, it's almost the same kind of dynamic. People are just flocking to this guy. Is it just the message or is this something more? Well, I, a lot of young people today, first of all, don't, you know, they didn't particularly live through the Clinton years. Right. So the... The, uh, the magic that accompanies the Hillary coronation that some older people feel, the nostalgia, 
They don't have that. What they hear Bernie doing is, is talking on issues very directly that, that hit home with them. Um, Bernie has been very, very direct, and I don't agree with Bernie on, on a lot of his solutions, but he has hit the nail on the head on so many of the issues um, of, of stagnant wages, the inability to find jobs, of the debt that the students have, of uh, the, uh, the predominance of a, of a corporate government relationship that's se seeming to run everything that goes on. He's hit the nail on the head, and they see that. What I think is interesting is I'm, I'm, I don't find myself necessarily always agreeing with every, every policy that Bernie proposes, but one thing I'm sure about, and I think this is where I think he, he's really caught the imagination of people, is he's the only candidate in this race that I've seen that really seems to care what poor people think. He does. He's, he's genuine, he's authentic, and it comes across. It right. absolutely comes across. Do you think if he doesn't get the nomination, and, and it's still not a decided, although... You know, it's funny because it depends. I mean, the mainstream media seems to want to do that coronation with Hillary. They, you know, every time Bernie went to say, well, he only won it by three points, you know. And, right. you know, she still is ahead of the superdelegates. It's like the, the press, the mainstream press seems to want her to win this thing, whereas the voters seem to have a different view. General, general rule, and I've, I've used this, this, this is a, a, my own cliche, but I use it a lot. Power gravitates towards power. Mm. Always has, always will. So if you're a large corporate media, you're going to gravitate towards the candidate who's got the power and the influence so that when you need something, you go to them, they can deliver. Yeah. It, it's just, it's the way of politics. But does this not also present a challenge for you? Because Richie Neal is the darling of the Springfield Press Corps. They all know him. Not everybody likes him, but certainly he knows how to work the press. Believe me, I know. I've, I've been in the media for a number of years, and I've, I've, I know how good he is and how good his staff is at, at planting stories and getting attention. As an outsider, a libertarian, a first-time candidate, does that make your job doubly tough to get the attention of those same opinion makers? It, it does, and I may not get their attention, quite frankly. Uh, but again, if you look at the Hillary Sanders dynamic this year, um, if you look at the Trump establishment Republican dynamic this year, it didn't really matter what the corporate media said or, or right. thought because they were wrong across the board because of, uh, of the, the revolt that is now taking place among voters. I wonder, I wonder if, if part of this is also a sort of giving the finger to the media in a way. I mean, it's pretty obvious who the establishment, quote unquote, wants to see in, the, in these final slots. But, you know, like you said, the voters have a different opinion. And, and then there's the whole question about whether this primary process is even really authentic. Do the votes even matter in the end? And have they been fairly counted and, and, or have people's votes been thrown out? I mean, there's issues of that in Nevada and I mean, in a lot of the different states. But as a student of history, I mean, you know that, you know, historically, you know, before the primaries became the, the, the way to set up a nominee, you know, there were guys in the back room with the cigars and the smoke filled rooms and they gave us guys like FDR and Kennedy and, and you know, Harry Truman. And, and so those, you know, those guys kind of knew what they were doing, right? Well, why wouldn't that work today, you think? You're also, you know, when you go back that far and even it's not that long ago, because when I was growing up in New York, we didn't have primaries. The party bosses nominated candidates and right. that's how you did it at convention. Um, but you also were at a time, if you go way back, when women were just voting, when in many southern states, African Americans were just voting, literacy was lower, um, a lot of, you had your heaviest period of American immigration in the 1920s and 1930s, and bosses running things was just the norm. You just asked me a question a few minutes ago. How come young people are, you know, like they're after this 80-year-old, uh, this octogenarian senator? Because times have changed. And now these people are on social media and they're talking to each other and they're angry and, they're, and it's a different time. Well, I think we've also seen the, the power of social media. And I know you have a strong social media presence. Uh, we've seen it. Cause regime change in other countries, Egypt, for example. Absolutely, the whole example. Arab Spring. The whole Arab Spring was was the result of social media. But you touched on something else, and that is that is race. You know, your district that you're running in is very diverse geographically and also also ethnically. Absolutely. Um, and there's a huge swath of minority voters, especially down the southern part of the valley. 
uh, and the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, mm -hmm. how, how does a guy like you court the, black, the, the, the minority vote, the Black Lives Matter vote? I'm, I'm kind of in a unique situation um, because not only have I, you know, in, in 18 years at the college level encouraged diversity and differences of opinions within my classroom, I also have six adopted minority children. I was going to say, yeah, you, you have kids. That, so yeah. my experience is different than the all-white experience, mm -hmm. and it's different than the all-black experience. It is the experience of taking my children, uh, and this honestly happened, to Colonial Williamsburg one day, and having the ticket taker look at us and say, you didn't want white children? Are you serious? I am serious. Um, it's the experience of having someone look at my, my daughter in a, in a carriage and say, oh, when she turns 18, does she have to go to her home to her country? Wow. So I, I bring with me the experience of, of both sides. And uh, if we have time for just a, a little we have yeah, We've had this discussion at the college. Very often, a white person will say, um, you know, I don't see color. I take you for who you are and for your, um, you know, for your qualifications and your character. A black person will often receive that negatively because to them, being minority, having that experience, growing up, having a different perspective on criminal justice, a different perspective on economics, a different perspective on the possibility of of, of what they can be with their life, what they hear you saying is, you don't see who I am. Now, in the first case, the white person is not trying to say anything negative. They're trying to say, I, I, I take you as you are. And the black person hears it differently. And very often, these groups are like this because they don't realize they're, they're kind of talking past, past one each, another. Exactly. They're absolutely talking past one another. Um, and I, because of my unique experience, I kind of understand where both groups come from. And I've, I've kind of relished the role at, at my own uh, college and in just in life in general of trying to get people to see through someone else's eyes. Um, if we could get personal for a second, what made you want to adopt uh, kids? What made you want to become an adoptive parent? Um, at the time, um, I, was, uh, I was married to a woman who herself was adopted. I have uh, an adopted cousin, and uh, she had some medical issues that would have made a carrying to term difficult. And it, it just didn't matter to me whether my child was biologically my child or not. It was just not an issue. And uh, we, uh, we started the adoption process, um, which was a, that's a story in and of itself. I bet. Um, and after, after three children, we decided, okay, I, th I think, you know, we're done with all of this paperwork and bureaucracy and craziness. You had an adoption vasectomy, uh, basically. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, but then three other children became available over the years, and the agencies called us. In one case, the mother actually contacted us and said, would you, would, you know, would you add this child to your family? And we, absolutely. So, family of eight. Um, and all I know about, about you, about, about your families that I read on Facebook, well, they seem like the, the great kids. They and are great kids. very proud of them, I can tell. Um, my oldest son is a police officer at UNH. My middle son is in the Marines right now in the Mediterranean. My youngest son and daughter are graduating GCC. Um, they are great kids. What do they think about you running for Congress? <laughs> my son <laughs> came up to me the other day. So, you're running for Congress, huh? <laughs> and he just kind of had that smirk like... Here we go, <laughs> because they know. I've always been uh, involved in politics a little bit. I was in the Conservation Commission in the town of Shelburne, um, and they know that being involved in politics absorbs your life. Yes. It's like being in theater. It absorbs your life, becomes your life. And but yet, as a parent of a, of a Marine who's stationed overseas, doesn't that give you a, a little bit of a pause when you start talking about things like foreign policy and security and this idea of being the world's policeman, that, that gives you a, another layer that maybe another candidate wouldn't it, have. Well, it does, because it affects me personally. Uh, you know, I, I'd, rather, I'd, <laughs> I, I'd rather that my son be protecting, an, protecting America than 
you know, the Jordanian king or, or uh, a, a shopping mall in, in Iraq. Well, King Abdullah did go to DA. Did he, go, he went to Deerfield <laughs> Academy, so he's, he's kind of one of us a little bit, sort uh, of. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to ask one more question on, on the racial issue before you put it to bed. Um, you know, I have a bit of a glass jaw because I've never lived a black experience. And I've, I've, it, when I was growing up in my town, there were literally two black kids in the entire town in my school system. And, and so I can't, I, I don't understand the dynamic, okay? And it's tough. I would think it'd be tough for public officials who've never lived that experience to understand the dynamic. But it seems to me, just as a student of history, that we're not in much better shape racially in this country than we were back in the 60s. Is that a fair assessment, do you think? Actually, I think it is a fair assessment. Um, what do you do about under, it? I don't know. I, I'll just give an honest answer there. I don't know. The, um, the, the underlying suspicions and um, the underlying uh, attempts to group people, you're, you're that and I'm this, mm -hmm are almost a part of human nature. Um, and it's only, I'll, I'll tell you this, I was raised in a family where th th there, there was racism, no doubt about mm -hmm. it. Um, and, and my father would say things that were, that were just awfully racist. Until someone he knew f from work ran for office and other people started making nasty comments about oh. that guy. And then all of a sudden he changed. It, and it was, it was slow, it was imperceptible. It was, uh, you know, he started with the, well, he's not like the rest of them. <laughs> um, but but it, it changed big time over time as, as he, who was raised in a 100% white environment, who knew only his experience, and his experience with minorities as he talked and interacted more with minorities and began to see through their eyes and learn what their experience was like growing up. By the time he was my, you know, my age now, totally changed man, yeah. totally changed man to, to the other extreme. Um, and that's what it takes. It takes one-on-one -on -one discussions and being willing to see through someone else's eyes. Not everyone's willing to do that. How have you changed over the years? I mean, you've been teaching for 18 <laughs> years. I mean, in your perspective, have you, have you grown mellower? Certainly, you're, you're no, you have no shortage of opinions, and that's great. But, you know, I guess what makes you ready to do this job? I've definitely grown better at... I definitely have strong opinions. And I can be very blunt at times. That, that, that's part of a New York upbringing. Yeah. Uh, being blunt even when I don't realize it. But I've also, in the last four years, for instance, I've been president of the teachers union oh, at GCC. That'll give you a learning experience. Whoa. Um, <laughs> and what you learn, and you learn this in a classroom with a diverse student body, and you learn working with a group of professionals, each of whom has very strong opinions, and you work as a union president when, there are pe when your own members are, are having a disagreement, um, you learn to lead. You learn to hold your own opinion back a little bit and listen and, and get the issues out on the table and clarified and then, and then proceed to some logical resolution that usually doesn't make everyone 100% happy, but works the best at that time. And over the years, I've been a lot better at that because I, I've been in a position where I've had to. And you're going to have to if you get this job. And, I mean, and, and there's no more job. dysfunctional system right now than the, than the federal government. Horrendous. Horrendous. Let's talk about strategy. We only have a couple of minutes left. All right. So you're going against Richie Neal, 900-pound gorilla, dean of the, of the congressional Official delegation. delegation. <laughs> uh, not an easy nut to crack. You mentioned it before, retail politics going door to door. In a district like this, that's tough to do. How do you break through? The toughest part for any newcomer in politics is getting your name out there. This, this will help a little bit, um, but you've got to go wide with it. What do you do? I want to spend most of my time talking to what I call affinity groups, those who have been most burned by Richard Neal, who would be most receptive to my message. And they're left, right, and center. They're across the board. Uh, sportsmen's groups. Richard Neal has been probably the single biggest anti-Second Amendment congressman 
sitting in the United States yeah. Congress. We never got a chance to talk about guns, but let's talk uh, about it now. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, he he was in support of allowing people to sue gun manufacturers if they got shot, which was consistent with his support of allowing people to sue food companies <laughs> if they became overweight. He actually voted for that bill. Um, so I will absolutely be talking to sportsmen's groups. Um, I will be speaking to a lot of Bernie, uh, groups that supported Bernie Sanders, women's groups in particular. Um, he has actually had a, um, a poor record on women's reproductive rights. Surprising um, from a Democrat. Yes, it is. Very surprising. Um, and I have always believed that no bureaucrat and no politician should be standing between any patient and their doctor in making those decisions. Um, I'll be speaking to small business groups because absolutely everything he has done, uh, his, his crazy support of the Export-Import Bank, um, has been towards funding large corporations, most of whom aren't even in this district. Export-Import Bank, which takes taxpayers' money and loans it to foreign companies to buy, uh, to buy products from American companies, 67% of that went to Boeing which is in Seattle. <laughs> um, talking to small business groups, they understand the pressure they're under, they understand the strain they're under, they understand the fact that a lot of them are just like hanging on like this. So speaking to groups, that's gonna be my, my, my biggest campaign push. What about fundraising? You have a website? Is there, I mean, is there anything you have to plug here? In We're in the process right now of getting together a website, getting together you know, a, a donate here. I expect the Libertarian Party is actually going to help with that. I am running as a Libertarian. Um, I'm going to the convention next week. Um, we are looking forward to big national fundraising from the party. Uh, kind of like Bernie, most of our members give $27. I was going to say, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's amazing how much he's raised just from small donations. And, and that's what it's going to take for us. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I, I look forward to this race. I really hope you have debates. I, I will definitely be watching if you do. We're going to have you back again, though, uh, long before this race uh, goes to its denouement, as they say. But I appreciate you taking the time to come in. And we covered a lot of ground, and we'll have more ground to cover. Tom Simmons has been my Chris, guest. Thank you. Professor of Economics and Business from Greenfield Community College. He is running as Libertarian in the 1st Congressional District against incumbent Richard Neal. That's Beacon Hill Update. Thanks for watching. We'll talk to you next time. For all of us here at FCAT, have a good day.